And so we read at the end of this passage. He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. There's a story told about W.C. Fields, the late comedian, vaudevillian, that he was in the hospital and it turned out to be his last day in the hospital. And his lawyer walked in to put some things together for him. And when he walked in, he noticed that uh, his client, W.C., was reading the Bible, which was very surprising because he was not known, W.C. Fields, as a religious person. To which the lawyer actually said, this is a surprise. I did not know you to be a religious person. And he put down the Bible, looked at his friend, the lawyer, and said, I'm not. I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> we encounter this lawyer in the story, the one that we know is the Good Samaritan. And we notice that he's looking for a loophole. He's looking for a way out. Now, I promise I'm not going to tell any lawyer jokes, and the reason I don't do that is that growing up as a young person, uh, most of my closest friends as it were, were lawyers, and I found out if I told a lawyer joke, they had one more priest joke than I had a lawyer joke. <laughs> so I kept it to myself. But here is one of the learned scribes of Israel, Judaism. We were just preceded in the story uh, in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus tells uh, his disciples as he looks up into heaven and he rejoices in the Holy Spirit, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants, yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. And then turning to his disciples, he said to them privately, blessed are the eyes to, that see what you see, that is Jesus, for I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And then there appears a very learned, probably prosperous, and a positioned man of his culture. And he doesn't see it all, even though he's standing right in front of truth itself. And we'll see this image over and over in the Gospels, so close, so near, but not quite. And so the lawyer knows the ritual law. He knows what's expected of him. He even knows the appropriate verbiage. And then Jesus asks him a question. He doesn't say, as Jesus often doesn't say, you're wrong. He asks a question and makes the lawyer, the young man, think about it a little bit more. And then he responds by telling a story. And it isn't a story that other truths are revealed. And he tells the story and it's very familiar if we stop and think about it. There are people who are doing their business. They're doing what they're supposed to do in the way that they're supposed to do it. And they're even doing it in the wrong part of town. When we talk about the journey from Jerusalem to Jericho, Jericho to Jerusalem, that was code for you're in a bad neighborhood. And even into the 50s, it was a well, 1950s, it was a well-guarded road because of the brigands and the robbers and bad things that happened. And we're often warned, don't go into that neighborhood. So that we know that the priest and the rabbi, or the, or the Levite, are doing the right thing. They're in places where they're not even supposed to be. So there's something about that journey that's okay, because Jesus does not stop and condemn them. But he does point out the Samaritan does the better thing. Now, a quick history about Samaria and the Samaritans so that we understand the impact of the story on the original hearers of this. 
is the following. Samaria was a section of the Palestinian area that had its own interpretation and religion and also considered themselves Jews, but different. They practiced different. The main difference is they did not worship in the temple. And they did not believe in the priesthood that served the temple. So Jesus goes to Samaria early on in his missionary journey, and he is totally rejected by these people. To which James and John, do you remember them a couple of weeks ago? What did they say? This is bad, Jesus. We're right, they're wrong. Send nuclear fire down on them. Wipe them out. And Jesus says, you really don't know what you're talking about. Wink, wink. Because what happens later in the story? It is James and John who are sent to Samaria to bring down fire the fire of the Holy Spirit. Now, it is a Samaritan that is walking along the road with the priest and the Levite. But the Samaritan sees the roadside attraction and he stops. Major difference. We stop. And what does he do? He draws this inner plumb line, this inner measurement, and behaves out of that place. Now, beloved, I used to be a college chaplain, and this used to be my office. It was the most freeing time I ever had as a pastor and a priest of the church. My job was simply to hang out in a black cassock and carry a sign that had a question mark on it, along with 39,000 of my closest friends at Florida International University in Miami. So this is also my toolbox. And Amos, the prophet, was a dresser, and a dresser of sycamores, and he was just a regular guy. He was not from the office of prophets. And he uses this metaphor, this image, called a plumb line. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with a plumb line, it is a weighted object with a string attached to it. And its sole purpose is to measure the vertical towards gravity, to make sure that which is vertical is upright and straight. And by the way, if we look at the prophet Amos in this story, we recognize two things. There's nothing new under the sun, one, because the other characters try to use triangulation, and he would have nothing of it. The second, if you listen carefully and read this, it was about a ritual and liturgical dispute. They were worshiping where they weren't supposed to worship. So Amos says the plumb line is God's righteousness. And because of that, both sides are leaning away from the center, from God. The Samaritan had a plumb line. It was in his heart. And within himself, he would push away everything except for this plumb line. He did not see his identity as a Samaritan from those people who were out there. He did not engage in some kind of false identification of himself. He listened carefully, the same law, as it were, as the young lawyer, the lawyer, to do what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and all your strength and with your neighbor as yourself. He had a plumb line that allowed him to show mercy 
Mercy was his plumb line. Unadulterated, generous, overwhelming mercy. And we are called to go and do likewise. I'm going to walk down, give everybody a heads up, and I'm going to share with you one of my favorite images about how to deal with the world in which we live, the arguments, the discussions, all those things that we find ourselves in the middle of all this kind of crazy conflict. And we've heard the dean talk about building bridges. We heard Mark, Father Mark talk about those mundane things that help us really discover who we are and who God is. I'm going to share you a plumb line that's always been helpful to me, and that is the cross itself. But we who are cruciform, we who are formed by the cross and to look like the cross. So you and I are a cross that we carry into the world. The vertical, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your body, and all your mind. Just an aside here to the acolytes, that's why we make the sign of the cross to ourselves. We say we give our mind, our heart, and our strength to God. That's the vertical part of the cross. Give ourselves to God. Plant firmly in the earth where the cross was planted. God's earth. God's work. The journey is not an exit strategy to heaven. The journey is here now. Love your neighbor as yourself. But what happens in the world today is we take this word called war and we war against each other, whether it's an individual, a family member, and we war. War, W-A-R, we are right. And what have we done in the world today in social media, in conversations, television, radio, when we declare war on the other because we're right? Have we ever seen, and we think that the world thinks this way and that we should operate this way, that whoever our neighbor is that we're having conflict with, that somehow if we are just right enough, we're going to convince them to come over to our side? And if we think about it, we spend a lot of energy doing that, don't we? How's it working for you? The image of the cross. Our journey, our accountability, this is me. And I'm not making a political statement because I'm using my left hand. We journey to the heart of Christ. And we make us accountable to loving the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind. We do this first. What happens is we are more than halfway there. This hasn't worked. Let's try this. The second responsibility is so live this life that it draws the enemy, the one in conflict, to the source of that peace and that truth. So we work and then we pray to meet at the heart of the Prince of Peace. There are no loopholes, but beloved, there is a way out. Thank you for listening.